Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to the first What Economists Really Do of um, our Hillary Term series. Um, so I'm Abby adams Prassel. Um, I'm Associate Head for External Engagement um, in the Economics Department at Oxford. Um, and I'm really delighted uh, to be here chairing this session given by um, Professor Max Casey, a professor in the department um, and who uh, runs our machine learning and economics group. Um, so Max is going to be uh, kind of giving us um, a tour through the political economy um, of AI. Um, so Max, as you'll know, you have, um, are, you, uh, are you ready to start? <laughs> yep. Thank you, Abby. Um, oh, sorry, actually, actually, sorry, one bit of housekeeping. Um, if you um, please put questions in the Q&A and the chat um, all the way through. Um, any clarifying questions, I'll collect and then pass them to Max at the end of each of his sections. Um, so if there is anything that you'd like clarifying, please do put it in the chat and I'll make sure to get that kind of passed on. Thanks. Okay, over to you, Max. Well, thanks for the introduction, Abby, and thanks for organizing, and thanks everybody for joining. So I'm going to talk today about the political economy of AI. And by way of introduction, if you read the news in recent years, chances are you've come along some of the headlines of this forum, like on this slide. So there's been all kinds of public discussions about the social impact of AI, including discussions about discrimination by automated decision-making systems, discussion about um, data privacy and data ownership, discussions about value alignment, the possibility of a robot apocalypse, discussions about who's accountable for AI decisions, and discussions about the impact of AI on the labor market, automation, and unemployment, and so on. And kind of following up on all these public debates and fears about the impact of AI, there's been a lot of policy activity in recent years. The two prominent examples are here in the European Union. Currently, there's discussion about an artificial intelligence act, um, where the basic idea, I guess, is to, to think about um, different applications of AI of various levels of risk and corresponding regulations. In the United States, similarly, there's discussion currently about an AI bill of rights that has been proposed by the White House, and um, similar measures are being proposed elsewhere. And so, as I said, there's, there's all kinds of different um, fears about the impact of AI that, that fall into different categories. So there's the discussions about fairness, discrimination, and inequality, the discussions about privacy, data property rights, data governance, discussions about value alignment, about the explainability of algorithmic decisions and the corresponding accountability, discussions about automation. And so this, all this space can be very confusing, both about like, what AI actually is, what's happening in the technology, but also all these different ethical, legal, social, economic concerns that come up. And so what I'm going to try in this talk is um, provide some degree of a systematic framework to think about these questions. And this talk corresponds to a paper that I'm currently working on, which has a similar title, namely The Political Economy of AI Towards Democratic Control of the Means of Prediction. And so in a nutshell, what I'm going to argue today is as follows. First, even though there's many, many different ideas and systems that fall under the header of AI and machine learning, what they have in common is that they essentially amount to maximizing some single measurable objective, maximizing some notion of reward or minimizing some notion of loss. Um, so that's kind of what's happening on the AI side. On the, other, on the other side, if you look at what's happening in society, there are, of course, many different people and different organizations and actors, and they all have generally different objectives. And that's, that's because there is economic inequality, social inequality, because different people, different people have different values and a number of other reasons. But what that implies is that if you have any automated decisions, then in terms of these different objectives, they will automatically generate winners and losers. And so then when we think about assessing um, AI and automated decision-making systems on a social level, then in some way or other, if we, if we want to provide a normative assessment, we have to trade off these gains and losses. And in order to make sure that, that what it is that AI is maximizing kind of aligns with what we want as a society, we, at the end of the day, we need to get to a place where we have democratic control. And that means in particular democratic control of the algorithms, but also of the underlying means of prediction, as in the title of my talk, meaning data and computational infrastructure in particular. 
and that's necessary in order to align the algorithm objectives and social welfare. And so as you might have noted on this slide, I've color coded some things in blue and red, and I will maintain that throughout these slides, the blue is um, throughout what the algorithms are maximizing and red is what we might want in society. Now you might wonder what has all of this to do with economics? This sounds like um, maybe computer science, maybe philosophy, maybe law. Turns out I think economics has actually a lot to contribute to these debates. Maybe not too surprising given that I'm an economist, but nonetheless. And so I think in a way like economics um, occupies a natural middle point between these different fields, because on the one hand, we share a lot of the same, same language and tools as machine learning and AI, in particular the tools of optimization and the tools of probability. But at the same time, we are also used to thinking about some of the aspects that I already mentioned, which don't necessarily come up in computer science. And that includes thinking about the world as multiple agents, basically different people who have unequal endowments. So maybe some people are rich, some people are poor, some people can control certain data or not. And they might have consequences, conflicting interests. You get the job, do I get the job and so on. And they might have private information. Not everybody knows the same thing. So those are all core ideas in how we think about the economy as economists. And that are important, I think, to also think about AI. And in particular, more specifically, uh, in order to think about the social impact of AI, there's the fields of welfare economics, of social choice theory, and of causal inference, who all have, I think, important ideas to contribute here to these debates. And just to, to motivate the rest of the talk, here are some examples where a conflict between algorithm objectives and social welfare broadly construed might arise. So one setting where, where algorithms make a lot of decisions is both in social networks and, and in search engines, essentially selecting what you see, what's coming up when you type something into Google, what's showing up in your Facebook feed and so on. And a primary goal for all these algorithms is to maximize user engagement and ultimately revenue from ads, since that's how these tech companies make their money. But maximizing ad revenue is, of course, ne not necessarily the same thing as we might care about uh, society. So in particular, in this context, there have been a lot of discussions about what's the impact on the public sphere and on democracy um, via filter bubbles, via um, polarization, via an increase of online hate speech and so on. And another important discussion here is what's the impact on teenage mental health if, um, if these algorithms induce us to chase likes and retweets and, and similar things on various platforms. Another debate would be if you have online sales platforms that set prices either to the suppliers or to consumers. And of course, what these companies generally want is to maximize profits. And in particular, if they have some price setting power, some market power, then that includes some, some monopoly price setting possibilities where they might increase prices um, above what we would consider socially optimal. And so again, this introduces the tension between um, what the algorithm is maximizing, which is monopoly profits, and what we might care about as a society, for instance, consumer welfare. And a last example where, where algorithms are used in a consequential manner are algorithms for, for hiring and selecting job candidates for interviews, maybe also for promoting um, employees. And again, these algorithms typically care about maximizing profits and maybe about intermediate goals, such as selecting employees who are less likely to join a union, which again might um, stand in, in conflict with social objectives, such as um, various notions of equity, caring about social mobility, caring about participation and worker voice, and so on. All right. So with this introduction, what I want to do for the rest of this talk is spent the first half roughly giving you some background. And so I'm gonna give you a, like a very, very quick crash course of what machine learning is essentially in 10 minutes. So that's obviously ambitious. And then I'm going to give you another little crash course on how uh, in economics and other parts of political philosophy, we might think about social welfare, about evaluating um, policies, algorithms and so on, on a society level. And I will also briefly talk about how we could bring the two together and in particular um, touch on questions about agents of change that again bring uh, come up in, in political theory in particular. And so after covering this, uh, this background material, I will use the ideas that I discussed there 
in order to briefly touch on these various debates that are already mentioned on the ethics and social impact and the regulation of AI. So what I will do there is essentially contrasting some, some form of a standard view, how a lot of these topics are currently being debated. Although of course, to everything that I will say there, there will be exceptions out there. And I will contrast that with an alternative perspective that's coming from, from this economic framework that I'm going to propose. And in particular a framework thinking about notions of social welfare that are aggregating individual welfare. All right. So now what is artificial intelligence? There are different definitions, but here is a very prominent one from what's probably the most popular textbook on artificial intelligence by Russell and Norvig. And what they um, state in a nutshell is that um, the goal of AI is to construct rational agents and def define rational agents as agents that select actions that maximize some performance measure or maybe a stream of performance measure over time. And these agents do that based on evidence pro provided by a perceptive sequence, so whatever is coming into the algorithm in the form of data and based on whatever built-in prior knowledge these agents have. And so this is a kind of a very generic general de definition. The goal of AI is to construct agents that maximize some notion of reward or some performance measure. And kind of within this general category of AI, there's a subfield that's called machine learning, which uh, dominates AI these days. And machine learning is essentially AI based on statistical inference, so based on learning patterns from data. Um, but it's not the only approach to AI. And in the past, actually, other paradigms dominated, like the construction of expert systems, where essentially you, you build databases of human knowledge and then use some form of automated reasoning, um, making deductions based on this um, human entered knowledge. But again, like today, uh, what's dominating is mostly machine learning. And so let me tell you a little bit more about machine learning now. And machine learning has, again, different branches. Uh, one one key starting point for machine learning is what's called supervised learning. So in supervised learning, what you're do, trying to do is there's some outcome, let's call them Y, and there are some features X based on which you're trying to predict these outcomes. For instance, as in the picture on the bottom right here, you might have a, a set of pictures of images in digital form, and you might try to predict based on these pictures is what, what you see here, a chihuahua or a muffin. And so you, you construct this prediction function, you have an algorithm that finds this function G here. And what you're trying to do at the end of the day is what your objective is, is to minimize the loss, where the loss depends on whether you got the prediction right or not. And there's, there's all kinds of key ideas um, that go in, into the construction of such predictions. One is a various bias trade-off. So essentially, if, if you're too flexible in your model, you, you might not um, not do very well with new data, even though it looks like you're do, uh, doing well for your old data. If your model is um, not flexible enough, um, then you can't fit the, the given data very well. And so in order to deal with these trade-offs, um, you have to see kind of what happens out of sample, which is what cross-validation is about. Um, so those are kind of at the, at the core of most supervised learning methods. And the prediction might seem like a specific task, but really it has a huge variety of applications. So it might be, you might think about prediction in the context of image recognition, like this example here, um, voice recognition, so basically predicting text given a voice recording, automatic translation, the predicting a text in one language given an other language. It might also concern kind of more directly socially impactful decisions, like if ever evaluating job candidates, university applicants, defendants in court, applicants for a credit at a bank, and so on. It might also be used to predict ad clicks for a given ad and given user and user engagement more generally, and so on. Now, a specific form of supervised learning is what's called deep learning. It's that's really just one among several approaches to, to supervised learning. Deep learning is essentially a method where you build this prediction function of G in a very complicated way, but based on many very simple functions, which are called neurons. So that's kind of motivated by this, this biological analogy of how a brain might work. Although the way deep learning works these days has moved away quite a bit from this biological model. So in, in talks about deep learning, you would often see a picture like the one at the bottom, 
the, each of these nodes correspond to, to one neuron and kind of getting data as an input um, as uh, symbolized by these arrows. And then it's again, producing an output. And at the end of the day, you have an output layer. So just because it was fun, here another example of this form, right? The, again, the input layer might be the pixels of such an image is here. And then the output layer might be this a sloth or a chocolate croissant. And this approach has been successful in particular for a very large rich data set. So I'm sure all of you have seen in, in recent weeks and months, like talk about GPT-3 and chat GPT and so on. Those are deep learning based language models. But typically, and especially in the settings that we're interested in when we care about the social impact of AI, prediction is not the end of it, right? We're not just predicting things, then we're making decisions based on these predictions that are impactful for, for humans. And one way to think about that is that often it's about assigning treatments and assigning treatments to, to different humans. So think about, uh, um, for instance, the hiring process where you have different job candidates um, who have their own access, like their CVs and so on. And your the decision that you're making is whether or not to hire a given applicant. Or similarly, you might have um, applicants for credit at the bank and the decision is whether or not a given person is going to get credit or a mortgage. It might be a decision by university who among um, different students gets admitted to a selective university. So this, for instance, was a big discussion a couple of years ago um, with the A-levels in the UK and so on. Or it might be in the context of medicine where you're deciding about um, what treatment a given patient should get based on their uh, demographics, based on their symptoms, maybe based on genetic data, which is, is something a lot of people have put hope on in the, under the, the header of precision medicine. And so all of these examples you can think about as kind of a second step after a supervised learning problem, where your goal is to pick again a function age of the, of the features X, and the goal is essentially to treat the people who have like a predicted outcome that's above some threshold. Right? So your objective is again, like what I put in blue here, um, which is basically maximizing the average outcomes among the treated. So for instance, the average performance of the employees you hire, the average health of the patients you treat and so on. And so to, just to mention one more branch of machine learning, what I've, what I've talked about so far is what's also called offline methods, right? So there are methods where essentially you have a data set, you analyze the data set, and then you come up with a decision function, G or H as it denoted it. Oftentimes what we're doing is also happening over time, and we actually get to decide what data we can collect. And so a canonical example of that are what's called multi-armed bandits. So if you think about um, the patient case again, right? Not all of the patients come in at the same time. So you're running a hospital and then and every day a new patient might come in and you decide how to treat that patient and then you, then you observe what happens. And so in that setting, um, you in some sense have, have two goals when you're making your decisions. On the one hand, you obviously wanna do something that, that's doing well now, but on the other hand, you might also want to learn something to make better future decisions, right? Like we do for instance, when we run clinical trials to, to evaluate new drugs or treatment methods. Or I mean, another example, which is one where this has been used a lot is again, how to decide to show a particular ad on, on a social media or search feed in order to maximize company profits. Or maybe in the context of, an, of a labor market service agency, you might have to decide um, what kind of training or what, whether to provide training to a given unemployed worker. And so a key idea that comes in then in these contexts is a trade-off between these two potentially conflicting objectives um, that are called exploration and exploitation. So exploration here means experimenting to figure out what works and exploitation means um, using what you have learned in order to, to do well now. And so in this context, you care about maximizing say an average outcome or an, or an average stream of rewards over time. All right, so this was all of machine learning in five minutes. Um, what I really want to take uh, want you to take away for the rest of this talk is that what kind of um, unifies pretty much all of AI and in particular machine learning is that there's some notion of a measurable objective or reward that the algorithm is trying to maximize. It's going to make whatever I put in blue on these different slides as large as possible or as small as possible equivalently. And 
in all of these cases, you take data as an input and then you produce chosen actions as an output, either in an offline manner or in an online manner where you adapt your decision function continuously over time. So that's AI. Now let me switch gears and talk a little bit about economics and uh, I guess also political philosophy. So how do we think about social welfare as economists? Um, or, yeah, let me actually uh, pause here for a second and see if there are any clarifying questions at this point. No clarifying questions at this point, unless anyone just wants to put one in the chat or Q&A. Nope, I think you're good. All right, uh, let's move on. So, okay, so we have AI. AI is maximizing um, some objective function. Now let's, let's turn away from AI and think about what's happening in society. And it's obviously hardly contested and has been for many millennia what it means for, for society to be a good society or what we mean for, to use more modern terminology of social welfare to be high. Uh, and there are many different, different answers to these questions, but a lot of them can be subsumed under this framework that, that I put here which essentially says that normative statements about society are based about statements based on statements about individual welfare, where again, welfare has to be understood in very broad terms here, um, could, could mean different things. And so to, to make this a little bit more formal or mathematical, we can think about a set of individuals, I'm denoting them I here, so one through N, so there are N different people here. And each of these individuals has some, um, some measure of welfare, however we define their welfare. And then as a society, we care about some combination of this individual welfare, which we can think about in terms of social welfare function, so some function F of the individual VIs here. And of course, at this point, probably a lot of questions will, will pop up. How do we specify all of this, right? So this, I mean, this is a train, general framework to think about um, social, um, social welfare, but it leaves like, a lot of questions open. The first, like who's even to be included among a set of individuals that we consider here? Is it all the citizens of a country? Is it all the residents? Why should we stop at national borders? Why not all humans on earth? Right? Why is it not clear that somebody outside the borders should be worth less? How do we think about the present, presently living human uh, versus future generations, maybe unborn? Um, how do we think about animals? Should animal welfare um, also um, matter for something here? So that's kind of the first and fairy question, but who's even to be included among the set of individuals? Second, there's the question, how do we measure individual welfare? Again, very many different answers that, answers that have been given here. So kind of a minimal libertarian answer might be just in terms of the legal rights that individuals possess. But then many, many have um, embraced a, a more comprehensive notions like thinking about the opportunities uh, that individuals have de facto or the outcomes they can achieve, thinking about the utility that they, they can achieve, about the resources they have at their disposition, uh, about ca capabilities more broadly construed and so on. And lastly, there's the important questions, how do we aggregate social welfare? How much do we care about, for instance, millionaires versus ho homeless people? Um, how, do, how much do we care about sick versus healthy people? About uh, does it matter whether some groups were victims of historic injustices and so on? Should that um, affect how we evaluate welfare today? So again, many, many open questions. Um, just, just briefly to zoom in on the second question here, like how many economists would answer the question how to measure individual welfare, which is in terms of utility. We're kind of abstractly speaking, and the way economists think about this is that individuals have some choice set, right? That might, for instance, be determined by how much income they have, how much stuff costs, and so on. And they have some utility functions, so how much they, they like different things. And the welfare is the maximum utility they achieve given that the choice, given the choice that they face. And so what, what's kind of intriguing about this framework, or one, one reason it's a very powerful framework, is that utility really has a double role here. On the one hand, we, as, we assume usually in economics that in utility is what individuals maximize, right? And on the other hand, we, we equate it to what's good for individuals, right? So there's kind of this assumption that whatever people choose is what's best for them. That's really what it means to, to care about utility as welfare. 
but again, it's not the only way that we could answer the question what what individual verifier is. What an an a different answer in the form of capabilities, for instance, would be to just directly look at the choice set and and leave the utility function to the side. Or the typical example here would be it makes a difference whether somebody's starving in a famine or whether somebody's fasting for religious reasons. Those are differences in the utility function, but the um, what we care about is whether somebody actually has access to enough food or not. All right, and the other question, um, the, the third one that I put up there is how do we aggregate across people? And the useful way to summarize that is in terms of um, so-called welfare weights. So those play a big role, for instance, in public economics, public finance, when we think about optimal taxation and so on, where essentially there's this, this fundamental question of how much an additional pound or euro or dollar is worth to a given person from a society level perspective, right? So how much do we care about an additional pound for a millionaire versus a homeless person would be measured by these omega eyes here, which mathematically corresponds to the slope of the social welfare function with respect to the welfare of different people. And what I want to emphasize here is that there is no objective way to pick these welfare weights. Um, it's, it's really ultimately a normative choice, but right? so this is not something you can learn from data in any way. Um, but um, when we make a normative evaluation, for instance, about whether a given algorithm is good or bad, whether we should somehow restrict it, we have to implicitly or explicitly make this choice of how much do we care about the impact of the algorithm on different people. And there's no, no way around that. Okay, and the last point I wanted to make here in the context of this discussion about um, kind of more the political philosophy or social welfare question here is, um, I mentioned we have the objective maximized by AI on the one hand, right? So that's, that's how we define the reward of the algorithm, what the algorithm is maximizing. And on the other hand, we have some notion of social welfare where we care about how different people in society are being impacted by the algorithm. Right, which is in particular also a causal question, like what's the causal effect of, of allowing a certain algorithm on, on the welfare of different people. And now if we want to bring those two together, right? so ideally we would have the algorithms maximize something that corresponds to a notion of social welfare. The question is, how do we get there? How do we bring those two to be the same thing? And in particular, this, um, this is often framed in terms of who are a possible agents of change, right? So which, which agents in the sense of individuals or organizations or movements and so on do have the, the material interests, the normative values and the capacity to move technology and policy to, to bring the objectives maximized by AI closer to, to what we consider to be social welfare. And one answer that you might give here, although it's not my answer, but it's the answer that dominates a lot of the discussion about um, ethics in the AI is essentially voluntary ethical behavior by corporate managers and engineers, right? So maybe we just have to change the culture. We may, may have to teach them some courses in university or through public debate, persuade them that the right thing to do is to build non-discriminatory algorithms or algorithms that respect privacy and so on. Contrast with how economists usually think about what, what um, private enterprises are doing, which is to think about them in the first place as profit maximizing entities, right? And so if the companies are maximizing profits, then the, the objectives they're going to pick for the algorithms are going to align with what it means to be profit maximizing. And that might or might not be aligned with social welfare maximization. And there are all kinds of reasons that economists discuss why, why those two might not be aligned, right? So just go under headers like monopoly power, externalities and spillovers, um, the, the whole distributional question of who, who do we care about versus who has the money. So there's many reasons why those two things um, will, will not be the same in practice. And those are these reasons that are typically very salient in the context of current applications of AI. And so then the argument um, I would make here is that in order to bring those two together is that we need different forms of democratic control. Right, we need some way um, as a democratic society to decide what the objectives are that are being maximized by automated decision-making systems and AI in particular. And so we need to have effective control over algorithm objectives by those who are being affected by algorithm decisions. All right, just to summarize again, um, key point here, different individuals in society have different objectives. 
and in terms of these objectives, right, which are denoted VI in the previous slides, we, uh, any any decision, any policy, and particular decision policies generated by AI systems will always generate winners and losers. And so, in order to go from from these individual gains and losses to some society level of assessment, society level assessment of AI. We necessarily need to trade off these gains and losses and aggregate them, and that's what these social welfare functions are doing. And um, if we have some, some perspective on how this aggregation should be done, then we need to ask the question, who are the agents of change who, who will close the gap between the algorithm objective on the one hand and our notions of social welfare on the other hand? And so this is, I guess, a good point again to, to take a pause and see if there are any questions. So they're not really clarifying questions. So and the ones which are currently in the q and I'm going to I'm going to hold, I think, for the end. Okay. Very well. <laughs> um, yes, looking forward to discussion at the end. All right. So again, what I've done so far, right, is like give you a very brief review of what machine learning and AI are about, which is mechanization of rewards, and discuss how economists and political philosophers oftentimes think about um, kind of the normative goals at the level of society about social welfare, which requires trading off um, the welfare of different individuals. And so what I want to do for the rest of this talk then is in some sense take these frameworks and use them to, to think again about a lot of these debates that I started out with about the social impact of AI. And so what I'm going to have on all these slides is kind of two columns on the left hand, something that I described as a standard view, where I'm sure many will object that, that the standard view doesn't correspond to everything that's out there, which is fine. Um, I guess I put here my understanding of, of what like a very common description of these problems is. And on the right hand side, I put up what I would describe as an alternate view, which is motivated um, through this um, social welfare perspective, thinking about the consequences of algorithms for for the welfare of the affected individuals and thinking about how we can align these objectives um, through democratic control. And so let's start out with the first one here, which has received a lot of attention in recent years, which is thinking about algorithmic discrimination, about fairness, and relatedly about inequality that increased or decreased the algorithm. And so the way that, um, although there are many different formal definitions out there, but the way that a lot of these definitions um, boil down is um, essentially calling fairness um, the approach of treating different people who are of the same merit, whatever merit means, independently of their group membership. And usually what, what's meant by merit is essentially what they contribute to, to say like a firm objective, which, which tends to be profit. Um, right, so the idea here is it's okay if a company is maximizing profit as long as um, they are not additionally care, um, caring about whether they're the employees or customers or whoever, the men or women or different ethnic or racial background and so on. Um, then it's okay because they're only considering like what's relevant for the decision, the merit. Um, and that's what's called fair or non-discriminatory in a lot of the discussion about algorithmic fairness. But um, note that tells us nothing about how, how unequal the resulting outcomes are um, both within and across groups. And since we only care call deviation from profit maximization or from, from whatever kind of the basic algorithm um, object objective we gave to the algorithm, um, is if, if we only call those unfair, might well be that the outcomes are very unequal, including unequal across groups. And so an alternate view, which um, rather than Abebe and I in particular argued for in a paper here, is that we should think just about the causal impact or the consequences of algorithmic decisions for, for welfare in the sense that I described before and for equality, right? So that's kind of captured by social welfare. If you have welfare weights, put higher weights to those who are worse off. And so there are many, many settings where these two perspectives will be in conflict with each other. So for instance, if you think about the consequences of more data collection, improved prediction, right? If algorithms are getting better, if there's more surveillance, Generically, that will lead to, to better predictions in, in the sense of the machine learning objective and will make the treatment in a, in a targeted treatment setting more aligned with merit. 
and that's kind of almost by construction good for fairness in the way it's typically defined but will very often be bad for equality right because the more you know the more differences there are across people and how you treat them and that will lead to more inequality or reversely if you think about any policies that restrict the algorithms in the interest of some some form of affirmative action like compensating pre-existing inequalities or some more direct redistribution then again those are typically bad for fairness in the sense in this sense and they're good for equality and again they're bad for fairness because basically because they imply unequal treatment that's not motivated by unequal merit in the sense of what somebody contributes to profit but they're motivated by unequal um, pre-existing status in society by equalities you might want to compensate and so i think it's really really important to understand that the way fairness is discussed often is not it's very much different from from thinking about the consequences of these systems for inequality and welfare and particular inequality across groups like gender and race and uh, migration backgrounds and so on. Here's another debate that has received a lot of attention, the discussion about privacy, data property rights and data governance. And again, on the left here, what I would describe as the standard view, where in computer science, there is this very well de developed literature on differential privacy, um, which is kind of a very, very nice mathematical framework to think about what it means for, for something um, to be private. And essentially the definition here is that it should almost make almost no difference whether your data are included in some data set or not. Right? So that means you don't really care about whether your data are being collected because it's not there's nothing is going to be revealed to a decision maker downstream that um, that makes a difference to you and so um, yeah so in some sense you're being protected because it doesn't matter to you whether or not your data is collected now it might be, su be surprising but uh, there are many mathematical results out there which say that machine learning and ai is essentially unaffected by differential privacy and the way to think about that is differential privacy cares about whether uh, we can figure out whether you as an individual is contained in the data, but machine learning cares about patterns in the data, right? They don't care about the individual data points. They care about the relationship between different variables, for instance, the relationship between outcomes Y and, and features X in the supervised learning example, for instance. And so um, you can actually learn all these patterns and make decisions based on these patterns while at the same time maintaining um, complete um, privacy of, of who is included in the data set. And so that, that has kind of important consequences because like one way that, that people think about privacy these days is essentially in terms of individual property rights. Right? I mean, currently your data are being controlled by, by particular big IT companies, maybe some, some intelligence services and so on who are, who are doing surveillance. And so a counter, a counter proposal would be to give everybody individual property rights over their data so they can decide on a case by case basis who to give their data to, which would seem like a big step relative to the status quo. But turns out, based on the type of argument I just made, it's not going to have any consequences at the end of the day for, for machine learning based decisions because those are unaffected by maintaining privacy. Um, and as an individual, you're only going to care about the consequences of, of your data being part of it rather than the, the patterns overall. And so that, that suggests an alternate view, which different people have argued for, so say, Will Join in legal theory or Achimoglu in co-authors in economics, which is the, the primary use of data in machine learning is to learn relationships. It's not to learn individual data. And so that leads to what economists might call information externalities. Right, so if, when you reveal your data, maybe that has very little consequence to yourself, but it has consequences for other people. And it has these consequences again, because, um, because patterns are being learned from these data. And so um, what, what follows from that, what followed from these information externalities is that privacy or individual data property rights cannot prevent harms from AI. And so, that kind of implies that only some form of collective data, democratic governance of data can address the harms um, resulting, any potential harms resulting from data collection and um, individual property rights will not be able to address these harms resulting from the use of AI. Okay. Um, 
yet another debate that has um, received a lot of attention, especially in, by, by Silicon Valley types um, and people who have watched a lot of science fiction movies is the question of value alignment and possible robot apocalypse. And so there, the, this idea, idea often comes up that there might be a gap between the between human machine objectives, right? So um, think Space Odyssey and, and many other movies since, since then. And so there's like, typically it's like man versus machine, there's one computer and one human and they are somehow in a battle of wills. And this idea is sometimes combined with this idea, although it's kind of a separate one of, of superhuman AI being able to improve itself exponentially, which then will, will lead to the domination of humans by, by robots. And so a possible solution then to, to this value alignment issue between humans and machines that's being proposed is either various versions of more carefully engineering the objective functions, right? The rewards that the algorithm maximize. Again, that goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning, all these different objective functions for supervised learning or targeted treatment assignment or multi-armed bandits and so on. Or kind of in a variation of that, um, a bunch of uh, folks have proposed something um, called, for instance, inverse reinforcement learning. But the idea is essentially to have um, machines observe human behavior and then kind of backward engineer um, the right objective from the human behavior. That's influenced, for instance, again, how, how algorithms like ChatGPT were built. However, again, this perspective falls short once we start thinking about not just one human and one machine, but thinking actually about a society with many different humans. And so what I would argue is that in almost all of the kind of practically relevant or hotly debated cases, we have that the relevant value alignment is between the objectives of those controlling the algorithm and the rest of society, right? So there's a difference again, do I care about maximizing ad clicks to, to make profit from ad revenue, or do I care about the, um, the health of our democracy and teenage mental health and other things. So this, this is not about man versus machine but in a way that we can solve by better engineering. This is about the conflict of interest and values between different parts of society. And kind of related to those separate point is also in many cases, not everything that we care about is observable or quantitatively measurable. And that again, imposes fundamental limits on what can be solved by optimization. And so again, I would argue the, the, the solution to this, right, to this conflict of interest is that we need democratic control of algorithmic objectives. The solution is not engineering, um, because again, it's about the conflict of interest here, say, between these corporations and other parts of society. And also to the extent that observability is kind of the constraining factor, which is something that economists have thought a lot about in, in fields like contract theory and mechanism design. There might be fundamental limits to what can be solved at all here in an engineering manner and maybe we just need to refrain from deploying the AI in some socially consequential settings. Yet another debate in, on, on the social impact of AI is the discussion about explainability and accountability. And so here the typical question that's been asked is how can we um, explain algorithmic decisions or which algorithmic decisions can be explained related also to this idea of legal recourse, right? So if, if a decision had been made that affects you, like you didn't get admitted to a university, say, is there a way for you to complain or understand why that decision was being made? And so then typically the, the solution proposed is that we need some form of a simple mapping from data to decisions. However, of course, the other question is, what does it mean to be simple, right? So it depends on the kind of training and background you have. Like an economist would consider linear regression as very simple. Somebody who hasn't taken econometrics classes might still find it confusing. And, and on the other hand, many economists will probably find the uh, decision by a neural network very confusing. And so this, related to this question of explainability is the question of who's accountable for the decisions. Now note that this, um, both of these are kind of about the individual decision, right? So there's a system, but then you as an individual have recourse uh, um, about a decision that was made about you or you have the right to understand why it was made. If it again, take a step back to a more society level perspective, maybe what we should discuss rather than like the specific mechanics of the decision is um, the objectives of the algorithm. Um, should we maximize ad clicks? 
should we um, say in the context of bail setting in court, like in the US, should we minimize recidivism and just incarcerate everybody with a high likelihood of committing a crime? whether or not they have committed the crime yet and so on. And so those are debates about objectives, which I think has, I mean, both because it, uh, it's a kind of the society level relevant question, but also because um, it opens the discussion to a much wider public, I think this is the right way to go about it. Because in many cases, you can have very complicated algorithms, but and AI and machine learning is complicated and not easily accessible. But uh, the question of what's being maximized is often very simple. Right, I mean, none of us is going to understand how the Facebook algorithm that um, selects what to show you and what ads to show you and so on is going to work. I think it's it's much easier to understand that what it's doing is trying to maximize clicks on advertisements in order to maximize ad revenue. And so, in that way, I think we can have a broad uh, democratic debate about even complicated technical systems if we focus on what it is that these systems are maximizing. Um, and I think that's, that's also the, the role of, of experts in this field is making the systems accessible to a wider debate by focusing on these important points, by understanding what are the objectives and what maybe is the space of actions that the algorithms are considering. Don't need, need to go into all the underlying technical details in order to, to have meaningful input into this question. And one more debate I want to briefly mention is the discussion about automation and wage inequality, which economists have been very involved in. And so here the, uh, there are the various versions of this discussion. So historically, people have discussed things like skill bias, technical change, so that new technologies maybe favor those with more education, increasing like the inequality between those with higher degrees and others. A related later argument was about um, polarization in the labor market so that um, new technologies automate away, especially kind of routine tasks in, a, in what's, what's traditionally the middle of the income distribution, contributing to an erosion of the middle class and so on. But what's kind of common to all these discussions is that they essentially will depart from some form of production function framework, where the idea is that total output in an economy depends on the inputs. That includes like different types of workers, uh, the capital that's, that's being used, the technology that's being used, and then the assumption that in competitive markets, wages equalize marginal productivity itself, a question that uh, or an assumption that that's become less common recently. Um, and in this framework, then it's quite possible that there's technological progress without shared uh, prosperity. Which kind of the way that formally plays out in these production function frameworks is that you have changes in technology that increase output, right? So for a given level of input, you get more output. But the slope of output with respect to some input, like for instance, the number of particular workers goes down. Right. And so you can have situations where overall productivity increases, but the incomes of many people decrease. Right. And so then it's a question of which technologies you pick to um to actually increase the, the incomes of those who are worse off now. And so I think this is a very useful framework, but it's also a very generic framework that has nothing really to do with AI because it applies equally to, to say the steam engine or any other major technology of the past. And so I think again, you know, it's, it's helpful to think more specifically about what AI is going beyond this general production framework by thinking again about AI being a system that optimize some rewards, choosing actions based on available data and, um, and asking then who chooses the objective of these alg algorithms, who controls the data and who controls the underlying hardware and software to do the optimization. All right, so let me summarize and looking forward to some discussion and debate. So there's been a lot of different issues and separate discussions on the ethics of AI that have been led in recent years in the public, in the media, by engineers, um, by people in ethics and philosophy in, in the law and so on. They, they touch on different questions like fairness, privacy, value alignment, accountability, and automation. And what I've argued for in this talk is that resolving them, resolving these debates um, ultimately in, in many cases boils down to thinking about how to achieve democratic control of algorithm objectives and of the underlying means to obtain them like data and computational infrastructure. And so in order to get to such a point of democratic control, needs all kinds of things, and it's um, definitely a long way to get there. 
need public debates, in particular public debate about objectives and the scope of actions of these algorithms. We need um, binding collective decision making and we need at different levels of society. Right? So this is not just about democracy at the national level and maybe it does on many, many lower um, levels depending on who is affected by a particular system. And with that, let me stop and looking forward to, to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Max. That was completely fascinating. Um, and we have a lot of questions, which is great. Um, people who have further questions, please keep putting them in the chat. Just in the interest of time, I've been trying to, I'm gonna kind of bunch a couple of these um, questions um, together. Um, I guess, given your kind of ending point, there's a set of questions around around democratic control and really kind of uh, how um, how we think about the scope of that, both in terms of, not just in terms of AI decisions, but are we holding AI almost to a different standard because you can think about kind of, you know, similar arguments that you've made in the context of AI applying in other domains. Um, and just if you have any thoughts on that. There's a couple of other questions around the kind of feasibility of democratic control in this particular domain, um, specifically around, um, you, I think you raised really, I think some of this was kind of addressed when you were talking about explainability, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, some questions around kind of, well, if people have imperfect information about the operation of these systems, or, you know, again, it's, it's kind of relating to the, like, do we really think that actually, uh, this focus on objectives is um, is kind of is 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 feasible, and and then the other point on that uh, on the kind of feasibility point was we're thinking about these systems operating in a global in a you know in a in a in a in a, in a, in a global world. Um, to what extent does that kind of modify conceptually or methodologically some of your conclusions? And if well, I guess the AI um, the AI Act at the EU level is just the EU, but if you had any thoughts on the how that kind of fitted in. So sorry, that was a lot, but those were the kind of ones I've summarized on the, kind of the democratic control point. Um, I mean, a lot of really important and interesting questions, I think many of which I don't have a good answer to, <laughs> but um, let's see. So, um, Sorry, what was the first one that you said? That I'm, I was trying to remember. <laughs> oh, uh, so I think so. Yeah. It was kind of uh, sorry. Let me let me um focus yeah. kind of a. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me put I'll, them I'll put into it down a bit. Um, <laughs> so um, I think the first point was really about kind of the fees. Well, let, let's just think about are we holding AI to a different standard? Yeah. So some of the arguments that you've made in terms of the regulation of AI, we can think of applying to kind of other technologies. Um, other. Oh, absolutely. I, and I think. Um, that's completely fair. And in some way, I think that these discussions about the social impact of AI are interesting. It's not just because of AI, but in some sense, they bring up old discussions we've had in many different contexts, including with human decision making in the past. Right. So, I think, for instance, the discussion about discrimination and fairness by algorithms, pretty much the same thing applies. And when, when humans make these decisions, in a way, AI yeah, is useful for having them because it's making things more explicit and you can write down and, and say very clearly what it is that you're maximizing, which is a lot harder to, to say about, about humans. But in a way, I think the same arguments apply there. And I would I would make the same arguments about how we've discussed discrimination over the last few decades, right? So where I think a lot of very, very fairness discussions coming from where you had like a civil rights movement in the US kind of complaining about rightly, I think, about um, very massive racial inequalities and various causes of that. And then in a way, a counter push that has very much narrowed down that focus and reduced the question of discrimination to the question of do you consider it explicitly besides profit maximization? But of course, you could have competitive profit maximizing companies and still have massive racial inequality, right? In a way, kind of boiling down the, the, the questions of the civil rights movement to a much narrower set of questions. And so again, that's coming up again in the context of AI, but that doesn't mean it only applies to AI. Yeah. The same is true for a lot of these, these other questions like privacy, like explainability and accountability and so on. Okay. How to achieve the democratic control? Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess that, that also touches on the question of, of agents of change, right? Where I think 
an issue I would take with how a lot of the current debate about these are going is that they are almost exclusively addressing themselves uh, effectively at engineers and, and corporate managers, which is not obvious that they are in a structural position to, to close this gap. And there are many other agents out there that should be an audience and participant in these discourses, whether it's consumer advocates, um, unions, worker organizations, people in the media, policymakers, people in courts, and many others who who have something to contribute here and have a stake in this. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And there's a there's another kind of set of questions going through a kind of um, yeah a kind of a, a, a couple of the interventions. Asking, I think, for a little bit more information on how we should think about defining what the counterfactual is um, in all of this. And that's both in terms of, I guess, the bias in human decision making um, or non AI um, type systems. Um, but I guess it's kind of also some of these questions are really about to what extent we think of AI as replacing human decision making, but complementing it. And if there's anything it, like kind of additional safeguards or concerns that you would have in that world? Um, all right, so even just, uh, again, many questions. Let, let me take maybe yeah, a specific example, <laughs> which be, is- It's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I guess I opened a lot of pen forms here, but in terms of counterfactual, let's take a specific one, which is social media and the selection of news feeds and what you actually get to see in terms of news, right, where, I mean, especially in the context of the recent takeover of Twitter, that there had been a discussion about alternative platforms, possibilities such of platforms such as Mastodon kind of substituting for them. And it's very difficult kind of collectively to switch there given the, the almost monopoly position that these platforms have, have achieved in, in certain domains. But there are ways that as a society we can um, generate regulation, for instance, through like rules and platform interoperability that make it much easier to, to move as an individual without losing, for instance, access to the feed from the previous platform. But it's a, it's kind of a question of standards that we impose to, to make this, the transition as an individual possible without an individual cost. And that can allow us to switch to different platforms where we um, have different rules on how, how search feeds, for instance, or how social media feeds are selected that align more with, with what we want and don't just um, have the aim of maximizing engagement and ad clicks and the maximum outrage to keep people as long as possible um, on the platform or maximum addiction or whatever it is, right? So there are many, many ways in which we can create these counterfactuals without um, losing the advantages of technologies such as social media. And the, um, there's a question too about to what it, like your thoughts on um, how important breaking kind of tech monopolies is um, for democratic control. Um, and also, do you have any thoughts on whether, you know, some of the trends that we've seen might cause us to redefine how we think about the definition of monopoly, I guess, from a kind of um, a from a kind of a legal or a kind of even well technical sense, how we would how how we would um, teach it in economics. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean uh, th there's various ways in which these monopolies matter, right? Like, I mean, one is they're just like massive political forces at this point that are very hard to to get around. Um, I mean, none of us can live without Google at this point, say, right? <laughs> Um, and I think like, I mean, yes, breaking these monopolies can be useful. I'm not sure it, it would be the solution to everything, right? So if you just have many smaller companies that are all financed by, by an ad model, where they're maximizing ad clicks, it's not so clear how much that by itself would change things. I think having standards like platform interoperability that allow us to, to switch social networks on an individual level with, without individual costs, those can be very helpful and are effectively devices to, to break uh, the formation of monopolies in the longer run in some of these domains. Um, yeah, but I think, I mean, also as economists, traditionally we are inclined to think about monopolies just in terms of consumer prices, right? Yeah. Which I think in this context misses a lot of the key points that are more about political control at the end of the day. And, um, right, because again, like, I mean, we don't really pay like, um, we don't pay, pay money for the services of these companies, we pay in other forms of the society. I think why you're focused as well, kind of going right back to, okay, so what's the welfare, the social welfare function yeah, here is, exactly. is, is so yeah. important. Um, so I'm going to kind of, uh, I'm going to allow us to run a couple of minutes um, over, use my kind of chair's prerogative. So there's um, a more kind of technical question um, saying that, you know, um, 
is the okay i was going to say so is there evidence suggesting that you know um the fact that in a sense we're using more data and larger data sets um does that allow in some sense machine learning models to consider for example rare observations on minority groups relatively more than a kind of a non-machine learning or non-AI perspective and like and, and, and like you know basically how responsive is machine learning decision making to the inclusion of um you know potentially these kind of rare observations um sure I mean I think it's it's kind of um ambiguous in general like what what more data will, will yeah. do in terms of say inequality of course groups right so I mean one thing that's that's reasonably straightforward to see it's just excluding like the information about minority membership is not necessarily going to help minority members um doesn't mean that inclusion necessarily helps them either it's, it's kind of a priori ambiguous which way that goes um so i think that the bigger question is and i think that that's also very very kind of there's often slippage and especially how machine learning people discuss it between what bias means right we have uh, uh, I'll tie it back in a second, but like what we have kind of fiscal notions of bias, which is just making accurate predictions on on average, say. And from that perspective, like having more data is kind of by construction good because you're making better predictions, right? And so then they would think, oh, that that means that making the algorithm more unbiased in some sense. Um, but that's only again if you think about bias, just in say predicting accurately how much somebody contributes to profit. It's not. Um, reducing bias in the sense of the, what the inequality between the different groups, and that one is a lot more ambiguous and can can very much go the other way. Fantastic. Um, okay, final question, just to close us off. So, um, where where do you think, or where? <laughs> like maybe I'm just asking basically about your future research agenda in this <laughs> question, but. Um, where do you think kind of future both social and technical research should kind of focus on to support further democratization of AI? Again, that's a big question, <laughs> but like if you've got any parting thoughts on that, that would be fab. I mean, there's one which is kind of part of what I'm trying to do in my more technical work is just um, thinking more, more formally about these things in the context of machine learning frameworks. What happens when we actually basically take into account that there are different people who are unequal in some way and, and have conflicts of interest which you don't really see in kind of the standard framework, which are all about like single agent decision making, right? Where you have one objective that's being maximized. And so again, this is, I think, very, there's a very natural intersection between the econ theory and machine learning theory that can contribute to that. There's another aspect, which I think is more on the practical and policy level, which in a way I'm less equipped to, to contribute to, but which I think it would be extremely important is, is thinking about how to, again, close this gap where we actually build this type of democratic structures of, of of contr um, control um, of objectives. I, th I mean, the way I think also about the role of of, of academics or experts, like I don't say somebody like myself, is again contribute to to this democratic control via pu public debate, right? Say as, as in this talk, like rather than than being the engineer who fixes things secretly in the back, being going through like the a discussion in the wider public and making these things accessible. Because at the end of the day, the systems might look complicated, but ultimately it's not that complicated what they're doing, right? They're they're optimizing something that we can measure and then we can discuss about how we measure it and what it is that we're optimizing. It's not such a complicated idea, even though, like, of course, there's there's a million technical papers that come out every year now on, on say deep learning or any other of these methods. But uh, but making the translation, I think, is an incredibly important aspect of, of how to get to a point of democratic control. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Max. Um, so I'm going to um, wrap this discussion up now. So for the kind of question, there are some practical questions about slides. So just so everyone knows, the slides and the recording will be made available um, on the Department on the Department of Economics. Um, and, and, the, and the slides and the paper are already available on my website. Oh, if there you go. And the slides are already <laughs> on Max's uh, website. But in terms of the discussion that Max just kicked off there, um, of course, you should everyone should check out Max's website. There are two other groups I'll quickly highlight in Oxford. Um, so one is the Ethics in AI Centre, which also brings together both kind of 
economists, but computer scientists, philosophers um, on this question about the kind of ethical deployment of AI. Um, and there's also a group working in the in the law faculty who specifically do stuff around algorithms um, at work. Um, final thing to say is that the next of these will be on the 8th of March um, on violence against women on International Women's Day. So for all of you, uh, you should uh, register um, and we'll see you again then. But um, thank you so much again, Max. Uh, that was really fascinating. Um, and yeah, the recording will be up soon. Bye. Thank you, Abby. And thanks, everyone.